recipes while we're talking about it. You might have time at the end of the course. I'll be here all week so you can have the talk to you later. So my talk is communicating the value of open source metrics. So Matt actually set me up with this keynote perfectly for this. I'm hoping that I've solved all the problems that you presented with this talk. So my friends, metrics are awesome. However, they're not inherently valuable. So we need to find focused metric sets that can help us solve specific problems. It's the idea of keeping the end in mind. So what's the problem? What are the metrics that you need to actually solve that problem? This will ena enable us to better communicate the value of our open source software development efforts. And I think all of us here can work together to make this real. So I'm going to do this by, I'm going to start by telling you a story of a project called React Google. Uh, it's an internationalization uh, library for React, which is used for a lot of front end websites all over the place. Um, both and all the companies under it use it everywhere. There's a lot of external companies that use it. Um, and I'm going to give you the perspective of it from the inside by using data. So this project went through a very long, slow decline before it eventually died. By show of hands, how many of you here have been in a project that has failed just like this one? For those of you that have any work, so when we break this up by organization, uh, the green are commits from both employees, the blue are people that are not both. It seems kind of obvious why this happened. The two engineers that were running this project over, over a number of years left the company and went on to better jobs elsewhere, and the project died. So you might think, well, great, we solved this problem, we're done here, and my talk's done. But no, this is not actually the case of why it died. And that's because individual metrics can be very misleading. We need a more holistic approach that provides better context about the entire ecosystem. And my goal here is to build analytics dashboards that solve specific problems. So, and I'm going to convince you by the end of this talk that this was an avoidable debt. We can do it by monitoring the development pace, so things like long-term trend lines, year-over-year -year acceleration, um, evaluating the contributor distribution in terms of things like commits and geography, and evaluating the organizational distribution in a very similar manner. Um, I'm going to show you some examples from these two products, Moloch and Screwdriver. Um, Moloch was started by AOL, Screwdriver by Yahoo. Uh, the names don't matter, um, so you can just think of them as Project Yellow and Project Purple for this talk. Uh, so first, development pace. We have acceleration on the left, cumulative on the right. With Project Yellow, you can see that there was this very sudden acceleration that and afterwards, a sustained rate of development. And this results in a new development pace that raises the trend line. So what happened here is essentially a development effort increased, and then that increase sustained over the course of about 10 years. And it's still sustained. Versus Project Purple, where there's been a very steady development pace over its lifetime, despite regular fluctuations here to here. So it might be slower one year, faster the next year, but overall, the pace is actually pretty consistent. So now let's look at React Intel. There were multiple persistent periods of acceleration throughout its history. And eventually it crossed below its trend line after spending more than a year above that trend line. And in fact, you can look at that and see that it, the project pretty much died right where it hit that trend line. So what, what can we learn from this? Consist this project had consistent development acceleration Though each one of those periods should trigger some sort of alarm for further analysis on this project. Additionally, the cumulative commits dropping below the long-term trend line should trigger a much bigger alarm because that project should have been on life support at that point. On to contributor distribution. So this is a, a, a we have the authors on the left, the commits on the bottom. Um, figure the bar that means that author has contributed more commits to this project. Project TL, you can see it's very, very top heavy. So it has a very strong dependence on two particular developers, and no one else has really contributed very many sizable, uh, very many sizable contributions. Versus Project Purple, which has a much, much more even distribution of commits per author, so much so that there actually is a sort of curve here rather than just straight lines. And in fact, this is reflected when you look at individual contributions over time. Uh, purple has is much more rainbow, there's a lot more diversity in how much content commits to participants, whereas yellow is primarily just two people. So then when you look at this distributed over 
time zone. In this picture, we're looking at uh, the number of authors per time zone. So for this particular project, there, there are multiple contributors, but they are primarily in a single area, which just happens to be the West Coast, which is where our office is. And those contributions, when you're looking at it based on commits per time zone, uh, you can see it's very obvious that those are coming primarily from two right? We already know this. Um, Project Purple, on the other hand, has numerous contributors in multiple locations. So we can not only do we have a lot in the West Coast where our office is, but there's a company in Japan that actually contributes quite a bit to this project as well. And that's also reflected in the commits per time zone. There's a much greater diversity of uh, people making commits as a whole. So let's take what we learned from that and look at React Insole once again. When we look at the contributions per author over time, there's these little sprinkles of contributors that um, are not the primary developers throughout the project's history. So people are showing up and making contributions to this project that aren't part of our However, the author distribution is still very, very top heavy. So this depends very much on the single author. But there are numerous contributors in diverse geographic locations. So this is an internationalized project. It's about making websites for international audiences. So it makes sense that there's a lot of people around the world who are participating as well. In fact, I think this chart is the most important in this whole analysis because it shows that there actually is developer communities for this project all over the world. However, it is dominated by contributions from two people, mostly just one. So what we learned from this, React Insult has a history of contributions from a diverse developer community. However, most of those people have never made more than one contribution, which is a problem. And the last major group we find organizational distribution. So once again, we're looking at both versus not both. Um, this circle, this pie on the right, the green is of, the blue is um, not of. The outer circle are the individuals. So if their color touches green, that means they're an open point. If it touches blue, that means they are not an open point. As you can see, the, the not oath portion is a very, very, very small one. Um, additionally, when you look at the commits as a percentage total over time, you can see that as time moves on, the external contributions are decreasing as a percentage total. Versus Project Purple, where there is a more diversity in terms of uh, not all the commits are coming from our company. In fact, on the slide you can see there's actually quite a few people outside of our company who have made sites of the commits to this project. And that has been consistent throughout the lifespan of this project. And once again, as a percent total for Purple, those extra contributions are increasing. So when you're launching a project with the goal of creating an external community around it, this is a very good chart to see because that means we're getting more and more contributions from outside of the world. So let's look at React Intel once again. So for them, the, the external contributions are a modest portion of the total contributions. I don't really think this is good or bad. It's just, it is what it is. Um, there's definitely room for improvement, but there are external people getting involved, which is awesome to see. But more importantly, those external contributions are increasing as a percent of total, which is really good. So, what did we learn here? They, React Insult had an increasing rate of participation relative to internal participation. However, that external participation never reached any sort of critical mass for it to be sustainable for the long term. So, how do we save this project? Can we save it? So, let's, let's start by looking at what works. So, like I said, there are numerous contributors around the world in this project which is a really tough thing to do for any open source project because it's really hard to convince someone else that what you're doing has value, value for them. Additionally, those participants were regularly there throughout the lifespan of this project. So there were multiple opportunities to reach out to these new contributors to increase their involvement. And then finally, the, as I mentioned, the external contributions were increasing over time. So if I had to summarize how to save this project, one slide, is this. Make this chart, which shows your commits per time zone, each call is an individual contributor. Look like this chart, which is the authors per time zone. So bring more equity from 
terms of how many contributions need to be made, the, the, the distribution of authors is created. So more detail, how to say this. One, evaluate the individual and organizational distributions to identify where your development communities exist. Two, identify the internal experts so that you can bridge them with these external participants. We no longer have those internal experts. So that means we're either going to have to recruit them from somewhere internally, or we're going to have to hire new people to solve this problem. Or find someone externally that's going to do it. Then finally, Set alarms to notify the proper authorities of when certain rental thresholds will cross. And this is for emergency use only. So when, when this project crossed this trend line, it was already dead. So at that point, it should have triggered a very massive alarm that says, this is, this is an emergency, we need to do something to rectify it. The plot twist, there is actually still a ton of people that are trying to contribute code to this project. We are regularly getting issue requests. We are regularly getting pull requests. There's just no one on the other end to receive these. So maybe it's not actually too late for this problem. So what does this mean for you? So that's what this is really about. So my goal here is to be able to quickly gather vital information about projects so that we can better monitor them and solve for specific problems. To do this, we need to use the right data to better communicate where and how resources should be directed to solve these problems that we identify. Metric sites like these could actually be very useful for a variety of individuals, um, whether you're a development manager, community manager, just run in the open source program office, um, whoever. There's a lot of people that I think would find value in this. And I want to work together with all of you here to solve this problem. So I have published all of the dashboards that I produced with this. Um, at this link. Um, these slides will be public later, so you can get the link. Um, they're all built in from our lab, um, and I've set it up so that it's very easy to just, if you have Docker Compose set up on your machine, you basically just run Docker Compose and you have all these dashboards that I've built. And I would really love for people to help me out and find out, you know, what, what are the problems we need to solve with these metrics? You know, who are the people that we need to target these dashboards for? Um, and by the way, I'm more than willing to grant this thing. Chaos Project. Um, there's not a whole lot of data there, or a whole lot of resources there right now. Um, but when it's ready, like I think this would be a great project for us to have. With it. And I need your help to make this possible. So some of the things that I still need to figure out is what is the best way to classify these, classify and organize these metrics. So do we do it by profession? You know, do we have a dashboard set for say a community manager or a software development manager or an architect? Uh, or do we focus more on a purpose or a goal? Um, you know, maybe identifying where it's going to run events or something like that. Or maybe we do both and just let, let users pick and choose which ones are most valuable for them. Uh, what other metric sets would be useful for monitoring vital health metrics? So this could be things like um, setting up a dashboard for monitoring development backlog to make sure that the development People that you are developers you're dedicating towards resolving these problems or keeping up with the demand. Um, or maybe looking at the dependence you have on individual developers. So you can see from React Intel there was one developer that the entire project depended on was left and it was all over. Uh, also, what other metric sets could it help identify and solve specific problems? Um, so you know we we noticed that there's a company in Japan that was participating in one of these projects. That's a company that we could, out, we could reach out to and try to build some sort of partnership so that we can kind of maintain the burden of, or share the burden of maintaining this project. Um, as well as identifying any sort of project risks. So um, is, does it depend too heavily on a single company? Um, is development decreasing over time, which is not always a bad thing. Sometimes uh, when a project matures, there won't be as many commits being made to it. And then finally, how can we better combine data sources to produce more context about these? So my talk just focused on, on Git units, and that was just primarily because I had limited time frame, and I was trying to put together some information for this talk. Um, but I'm more interested in the interaction of all these data sets. So uh, what are the effects of running events on things like development pace, 
um, the distribution of contributors, uh, organization distribution. You know, so when you run an event, do you actually have data that shows your event did something that's beneficial for the community? So that's it. I guess we have about four minutes for questions. Um, so yeah. So, Moloch, Project Yellow, in this, during, while doing this, I essentially identified it's going through the exact same thing that React Intel went through. Um, and and now, now we actually have an understanding of, you know, here's a project that is existing now today that has this same problem that we've witnessed in the past. So, how do we rectify this? And I think we have some sort of answer to that based on the data I got. As a data point, one of the things I've noticed is that when you have open source projects that have either a face to face session wherever in the world they may be, or an online presence like a IRC or Hackathon online in real time, it seems to trigger, I mean, I, I label that as an event. And from what I've seen so far, is almost every one of those projects, as soon as there's an event that happens, the following week or two weeks, there's some you know, spike in activity, it could be bug fixes, it could be whatever, but it seems to at least give it some sort of life. And I think the face to face portion seems to be better than just the online part, where I think the human connection changes how people interact as well. So, and then to build on that, once you've had these events and you see a slight burst in activity, is that is that activity sustaining itself? And, and are those, those people that maybe they made their first contribution at that event, did they come back for a second one? Because that is quite often just as difficult as getting them Yeah, so that's, that's exactly what I wanted to track. So notice that there was going to be a fall off and some people who do it for the first time and then that's it. And but what happens is after an event where they have face to face, it seems to pick it up. Yeah. Because there's a lot more comfort level. And I know who I've seen you, I know who you are, and I'm better able to trust you to do whatever it is. And so it seems to change the dynamics of that's what I've seen in the last five years. Yeah. Anyone else? I think this no. guy's really nicely with the growth of the journey and the client work group. So in, for those of you that aren't familiar in the chaos project, we have several work groups. And, and growth maturity and client is one of the work groups that takes a look at just what the metric set can be, and then also what the tooling can be to help and, and I focus on that just primarily because that fits my use case, you know, which is why I want more community involvement. Because there's a lot of other people that are interested in things that I'm not interested in that might still benefit in some way. So the identification of the dying project might be a shared problem. <laughs> <laughs> but more importantly, how to save it. Or not save it. Yeah. 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 It's, it's okay to be like we can divest from these projects or they've served their purpose or the right. framework is no longer so we shouldn't be anymore. It's hugely beneficial. It's reducing the noise is a huge problem for big organizations. Um, so thank you for coming in and talk like this. I don't think it's necessarily a failure. Like, uh, it, it is still it, in, in this case, it, I believe it was because uh, I, I did talk to a developer that was around when this project was a, was a thing, and he indicated to me that it was still very widely used within our company. There's still a lot of people that need bug fixes and features and, and all this stuff. And the primary reason that no one has taken it over is it's a big complicated project. And no one is willing to step up and say, this is mine now, because they just aren't willing to do that. But, but yeah, I, I get your point. Sometimes projects just do, they mature, and then there's no need to keep them adding. And, and like, just thank you for, for presenting. I think it's helpful to not say, like, when stuff goes wrong, 